Alright, here's the deal. You got this idea, this real big bad you want to run against your party. You got all their abilities written out like a Marvel supervillain wiki page. You've been practicing their accent and even have scripted lines during combat. You even went out and got yourself a miniature from a mini building website and painted them. Not just that, you got the whole world built around them and it all connects back to them. Every thread in your story connects either to or through them. All roads lead to Rome type villain. Any direction your players go, it all leads up to this villain. Now I only got one question for you. Where does the party start? What happened? Uh, they don't know. What do you mean they don't know? Well, that's why they're here. They need help with starting their campaign. Help with... that That's too vague. Like, getting players? Writing a beginning? It can't be as vague as how to start a campaign. Ah, sh... So, you have a story written up, you have the big bad, you have the quests, but you don't know where to start the story or how to introduce your player's characters into the campaign. Well, neither do I. I don't know your campaign or your player's characters, so I can't tell you what fits perfectly for your campaign. Why not, you stupid bastard? But I can give you some relative advice on starting campaigns, the do's and don'ts, and the methods to keep your players coming back. Also, because the topic of how to start a campaign is super broad, because I don't feel like submitting future me to endless hours of editing, we're going to focus a topic for this video. For starting a campaign, we're going to focus on three aspects, creating the beginning, connecting it to the narrative, and assembling a party. Now let's get into it. Picking a location for the beginning of the campaign can either be a crucial part of the story or simply a jumping off point to get your player's characters into the world. It could be a small town the players will have to regularly revisit for new and better jobs. Maybe this town grows with the party as more people move there because the party's making the area safer. Maybe the town is already a sprawling metropolis and the party needs to figure out who's killing folk in the dark of the night. Maybe it's not even a town, but an old dungeon or crypt full of goblins that the party was tasked with clearing out. Also. Consider this, the campaign doesn't have to start in a town or an important location. It can start mid-travel or the old time-tested classic in a tavern. Some people will say that tavern starts are overused or too easy and even unimaginative. And that might be true, but it's your campaign. If you want to start in a tavern, then start in a motherfucking tavern. Who's gonna tell you no? But Dabis, what about that awkward beginning phase where no one knows each other and no one has a good reason to? We'll get to that. Your starting location can be a multitude of different places, and it's up to you if it's crucial to the plot or just another stop on the windy road to the big bad, if it isn't already a windy road. Maybe your players are transporting something important to the next town and get ambushed. Suddenly, the MacGuffin is gone and now your players have to hunt it down and retrieve it, or else they don't get paid. Your start will also determine the attitude and first impressions for your players. Starting in a tavern is the safest bet, especially for new players, as it gives them a chance to exercise their RP muscles with NPCs like the bartender, but also because everyone goes to the tavern, and some of the best stories start in a tavern as strings of fate randomly weave their way together. Similarly, starting with travel shows a low harm start while also telegraphing to the players that travel might be the norm for this campaign. Or if they start in a metropolis, solving crimes and fixing problems mainly in the city, they may expect to just stay there unless you present them the opportunity to leave. Your beginning location will set the minds and moods of your players and their characters, so it's important to either drop a hint or tell them up front what the norm for the campaign campaign will be. The most important part of starting the campaign is ensuring the start hooks your players into the story. It doesn't have to shotgun them straight into the overarching narrative for the campaign, although it could, but the start should be interesting in and of itself. The beginning is what compels the players to learn more about the world, to seek its secrets, to explore and conquer, and to fix its problems. This is why you need to make your beginnings interesting and fun. If your campaign isn't fun, your players won't be interested, and if it isn't interesting, your players might not be having fun. It's a cycle. Understand, however, just because it's not interesting to you, that doesn't mean it's not interesting, period. Your players might find your concept interesting simply because they haven't heard about it before. You might think it mundane, but have you considered it might be because you understand every aspect of it? There's no magic to it anymore because you see everything from behind the curtain. Your players don't know what you know, and that's the fun part. Every writer will tell you there's always an improvement they can make in their world work, but that's because they know the duct tape and dreams that are holding it together that none of us see. But Dabis, 
How do I make my starts interesting to my players? Well, again, I don't know your campaign story or your players, but I can tell you some tricks for getting their attention. Firstly, your players showed interest in your campaign because they want to play D&D, and part of playing D&D is discovering the large problems in the world and seeking a way to eliminate those problems. In this stream of motivation, there's three options. Drip feed the narrative to your players and make them want to learn more. Up front and center, tell your players out the gate what the larger problem is, or just shotgun blast them into the world by basically saying the tavern's on fire and you can either put it out or escape it. Drip feeding can start shotgunny with a story like the blacksmith's daughter has been stolen by a band of goblins and now they're holed up in an old crypt they're using as a nest. What the players don't know in that scenario is that the crypt is an old burial ground for a long gone order of knights who protected the ancient bloodline during their time that has since been lost and they will employ the party to find this bloodline and ensure its safety or continuation. You don't tell the players out the gate what the objective is but you try your best to insert them into the narrative from the get-go. You can also start up front by straight up giving your players essentially the monologue from the back of a book, saying things like, The ancient Lord of Darkness, Margon, has risen once more from a thousand years slumber. The world awaits this great evil and its next move, as it may very well determine the end of the world as we know it. Not much is known about Margon's plan, other than it seeks to encase the world in internal darkness. Only one band of heroes from times past has been able to quell this ancient threat, but they are long since gone. Their names passed down as myth and legend to the people of today. Rumor has spread across the countryside that unless someone can stop or delay their ritual, Margon will destroy the world in one month. Will Margon be defeated? To which your players hopefully respond, HELL YEAH! But they can also just choose not to, and then Margon plunges the world into darkness, which can also be a whole different story route for your campaign. Also, if your players are argue about what's their stake in this world or campaign. It just means they want their character to have consequences in the world. They want to be invested. These people usually write backstories for themselves. Which leads me to my next trick. Having your players send you background information about their character and adding things from said background into your world is the easiest way to engage players into your world because it shows two things. One, you read their backstory and you'd be fucking surprised how many DMs ignore this which, like seriously, your players are writing story for you. Take that sh**. And two, you actually care about the players and their characters. Players will be 100% more satisfied knowing their characters died in a way that makes sense to their personal narrative than having that same character die because the DM spiked the combat encounter CR a bit too high. It's like if Harry Potter would have died in the Philosopher's Stone fighting Professor Quirrell. Like what the f- <coughs> If that doesn't work for you, or if your players just don't have backgrounds for their characters for whatever reason, then have the party complete random jobs and quests. Make them slay the troll in the forest, or clear out the goblin nest, or even persuade or dismember the bandit camp. Let them earn some loot, maybe even a magic item or two. Give them valuable materials, and then, if they're comfortable with it, have it all get stolen. Your players will employ CIA level tactics to recover their gold and items. When they go looking for the items, lead them towards your narrative. Maybe someone working for your big bad stole their stuff, and now the party's hunting them down. When the players get their items back, have them realize one of the items is necessary for Margon to complete their ritual, and until they have the item, Margon and his forces won't rest until the item is theirs, and if it wasn't important to the big bad before, it is now. This won't work forever, but it's a simple way of getting your players interested in the narrative. On the idea of player comfort, I'd like to go into a small tangent. Ensuring player comfort is essential to your players having fun. Player comfort is also a good way to ensure they keep coming back. If your players don't feel safe at your table, they won't have fun and you definitely need to know. They might be hiding their insecurity and be waiting for you to ask about it. The best you can do is check in with them in the group chat or even individually. Don't outright call them out on their insecurity or tell them they're acting weird, but maybe hint at the idea of, hey, there's this weird tension in the group. Don't make it obvious about who, but just be willing to communicate. Let your players know if anything's wrong or if they're feeling a certain type of way that you are always available, but don't don't, don't tell them you're a therapist, cause you're not. Unless you are, in which case, cool. But there's a 99% chance you're not, so don't act like one. But be an ear. 
Ask the other players in private if they notice anything, or if something's happening IRL, make sure everything's okay. Also, when D&D is on, life gets left at the door. There are obvious exceptions to this rule, like emergencies or prior obligations, but overall, we're not here to discuss real life, we're here to hang out and have fun. Now if those things come up naturally and no one gets heated or uncomfortable, then you're clear. But if people start arguing, step in and calm the situation. Remind everyone we're all friends playing a game together. A good rule of thumb for both sides of the table, leave it at the door. Y'all gather to solve problems together not create problems with each other. Safety glasses off. Okie dokie. So far, we covered starting locations and player motivation with some touching on narrative connection. Let's see if we can expand the connection and lead it to assembling your team of Avengers. Connecting the beginning to your narrative can be a tricky road to navigate, especially if you have everything written out as a narrative rather than plot points in an outline. I talked more about outlines in Mastering the Dungeon, but essentially, outlines allow for better creative flow in your storytelling, allowing you to easily plug and play with narrative rather than setting anything in stone. In this sense, have an outline written, but expect your players to begin with their own agenda for themselves. The most important thing to your players is their characters, so it's important to remember they each want to do things unrelated to your narrative. But how do you connect the beginning to the narrative? In your story, find a loose thread. If one doesn't exist, create one. Create a strand that goes and does its own thing, something that catches the player's attention. Maybe a drunk bandit is bragging about Margon's takeover and telling people about one of the items for the ritual. The party can interrogate them and get the information and go steal the item. The most important word of that sentence is can. I didn't say they would, but I made it a possibility. If they don't take the thread, tie it up off screen and make another one. Eventually, they'll have to take a thread, and if not, tie them into a thread. A bit of railroading doesn't hurt anyone, but only if it's done sparingly. Some things to avoid in railroading are prolonging the railroad and forcing the narratives like kidnapping the player's characters and telling them they're just somewhere else now. Another classical thing you can do is dream sequences. Have the players be visited in their dreams individually by the gods to tell them about Margon's takeover and what it will mean for the world. This should hit hard for clerics and warlocks and hopefully the other characters as well. One final point, the beginning should feel like a stumbling phase, where the characters or party just seem to find their way into awkward scenarios. These scenarios should ultimately culminate in discovering a loose thread that connects them to the central story. This is where the dungeon master will have to do a lot of nudging to get the characters into the central conflict, if the conflict isn't already an established goal. Now, from all of this, it might sound like there's no bad way to start a campaign, but there definitely is. You shouldn't start out by telling everyone what they're doing. You're not directing a scene and playing those characters your players are. You introduce the session by letting the players know where their characters are and tell them what's happening around them. From there, the players will insert their characters how they would like to see them placed. The players will tell you how their characters are reacting to the situation, not the other way around. For first time players, maybe nudge their characters somewhat, but don't completely rip the reins out of their hands. Hold one lead while they hold the other, and when they're ready, give them the whole lead. This is to help them break out of the shell of awkwardness with role-playing around others. It can be spooky the first time. Also, do not force RP. That shit is gross, and your players will grow uncomfortable from it. Refrain from saying things like, you may now talk amongst each other, like you're commanding them to have a moment. Newsflash, buddy. Moments happen naturally. They are the product of shared emotional experience, of creating a stronger bond between two people, not out of necessity, but shared feelings. Even if platonic, moments can be sitting by the fireside sharing stories and relating to each other through them, or two characters having an interest and geeking out over that interest when it comes up. Moments like these happen naturally, never on command, and to force them is to make everyone uncomfortable. <sighs> Alright, that rant is over. But all we've discussed so far is creating the beginning for the campaign. What about actually playing the game? How do you bring the human element into the game, with actual real people gathered in the same place together, in person or online? Well, that's actually the hardest part. Gathering players is a challenge in its own right. There are methods of completing this task, but all of them are ultimately at the mercy of others' time and will. People are willing to play D&D, 
But unfortunately, we live in a very busy and chaotic world, and most people have lives going on outside of hobbies and personal interests. I know this sounds depressing to people hoping to run a campaign, but it's not all gloomy and unforgiving. The best way to assemble your Avengers is by posting ads in places like Discord servers and local game stores. Through my years of dungeoning and dragoning, I've come across many different people and have joined many a Discord server. Game stores will probably either have a Facebook page or Discord server, or even some kind of quest board where they can post information information about your campaign. This won't guarantee people will join, but it sets the line out for people to observe your idea and decide if the times work out for them. That's another thing too. One of the greatest challenges with assembling your Avengers is scheduling. Your players have their own lives that they need to attend to, and schedules they may not be able to work around. I see this all the time where campaigns get players interested, but they fizzle out because of scheduling conflicts. The best thing you can do is set times and dates you want to run or play and allow people to find to you. If their schedules align with yours, then it's a match made in heaven and you're good to go. Eventually, enough people with concurrent schedules will congregate and bada bing bada boom, you got your Avengers. Way to go. What's more important is ensuring you keep the players at your table by following through with the fun. You have your players, now entertain them. Now don't get upset if your players suddenly leave the campaign, especially if they're forced out, either by being toxic or having to deal with IRL situations. In the latter, be willing to support them and ensure everything's okay. Okay. If not because they're a confirmed player in your game, then because that's just a good human thing to do. Because good people look out for each other because we're all we got. If it's temporary, then they'll likely come back. Players coming and going is a possibility, and your campaign will change depending on the participation of your players. It can happen where the campaign stops midway through because people stop coming. It's sad to see it happen, but it's important to know you likely didn't do anything wrong. Sometimes players just can't make the time, but a group that's truly interested in your game will make that time and will plan around schedules to ensure they can make it to your games. These are the ones you wanna keep around and reward for being being there through thick and thin. To top off the player gathering, let's end on the note of Session Zero. Session Zero is essentially the brainstorming session for your campaign. The calm before the storm where everyone gathers and gives info about their characters or starts creating them for the first time. Session Zeros aren't always needed, especially for one shots for high level play or just for funsies. They are helpful though for the dungeon master to better understand what the players want out of their characters as well as the campaign. It's also for the players to interact with one another and share ideas and backstories but don't force this. Maybe suggest it, but don't enforce it. This is also that session where you answer questions about the world, like common knowledge and special rules you run. Also, allow me to introduce consent sheets. These simple sheets of paper will tell you everything you need to know about your player's personal triggers without needing to make it public. There's plenty of these online, and I'll leave a link to one in the description that's both fillable and printable. These are just another thing that tells your players you care about them and that keeps them interested in playing with you. You. That's the real measure as well keeping your players interested in you as the dungeon master, rather than just thinking the campaign is interesting. Eventually, enough time will pass that you'll be a tight friend group rather than strangers that meet once a week. This is the best case scenario, the cream of the crop, and what every group of D&D players should aspire to be. But most importantly, this needs to happen naturally. But all of this pales in comparison to the most important advice, make sure the players are having fun. I know I bang on this point like an alarm bell, but it's that important, and it's something people overlook. Is everyone having fun? Now, you're allowed to have fun at the player's expense, as I'm sure the players will have fun at yours, but make this an even balance. Don't f*** <coughs> over your player's characters just because they went down the path you wrote nothing about. Don't write Tiamat into that path to deter them, or even unwrite that path from existence. Write that the path leads a different way, but to the same goal. Better yet, rewrite this other path as a secondary way with its own unique challenges equal to the other path. But make sure everyone is having fun, because if they're not having fun, your players will stop showing up, making excuses not to play with you anymore or just saying they're not having fun. This is why I stress to make sure fun is number one. This applies both ways too. If you're not having fun, then tell your players you're not having fun. Tell them you want to take a break and play for a while. Good players will recognize the need for a break and happily let you take it. Maybe one of them will run on Tuesdays instead, while you get your creative juice reserves filled again. Plus, nothing is better than playing for someone you used to DM for and pulling the same shit they pulled in your campaign. So, 
That's creating the beginning, connecting the narrative, and assembling players, with some tangents into session zero and player comfort. That's quite a bit, and I'm sure I missed something in this goliath of a topic, but that's what comments are for. By the way, let me know what I missed in those comments, and I might cover it in a future video. While you're pushing buttons, be sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this content. I post a smaller form series called Rolling Insight every week on Mondays at 12pm MST, covering simpler topics. I already have a couple posted for you to chew on, with many more on the way. In any case, I hope I answered the question. But also, hey, I, I think you're getting a text.